this lesson today, I want us to continue a discussion that we began last week of postmodernism. As I laid out for you, in a, in a very broad way, what we find today in our culture um, and all the conflicts that are going on in our culture, much of this rests on two philosophies that at one time were competing but now have kind of melded together. Um, those two philosophies are postmodernism and neo-Marxism. Now, I'll discuss neo-Marxism in a, in a future lesson, but I want us to continue our discussion today of, of postmodernism. Now, as we talked about, postmodernism finds its roots uh, going back, well, you can trace them back hundreds of years, uh, clear back to the, to the Dark Ages, uh, a time characterized by, by superstition and, and the domination of, of, of tradition. It was followed in the 16th century by a period that came to be known as the Enlightenment, in which philosophers and thinkers um, begin to say, listen, what we need to do is study our environment, study our world, use our reason and, and our logic to understand what we see and what we perceive. That was a huge transition in thinking and a very, very important one as well. As a result of that, um, reason and logic and science begin to dominate in our culture. And, and with that, great strides were made uh, in many areas. Then in, oh, the mid 19th century, early 20th century, we find the advent of what is now called modernism. And essentially modernism said, we like the idea of, of reason and logic and science and, and figuring out how things work and, and making them work for us, but, but we need to put together some kind of ideology which would allow us to utilize all this knowledge that we've gained in order to create a kind of utopia on this earth. Now, modernism unquestionably has allowed us to enjoy a quality of life that human beings had never known before. Um, breakthroughs medically, for instance, we are so blessed today to have the, the modern medical techniques that we do, which are all the result of modern thinking, of, 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 of science and, and reason and logic. And all areas of our life have been impacted to a tremendous degree by this. Look at, look at the technology that we enjoy today. But the problem with the modernist approach to creating a utopia uh, in, which, in which human beings would find themselves fulfilled and happy was that the models that they came up with, which included um, Marxism and communism, capitalism, fascism, and so on, all of these during the 20th century to some degree or other were perceived to have failed, and, and rightly so. And so <coughs> modernism was seen as letting humanity down, as, as not providing the answers philosophically that were needed for us to, to move forward. Um, the disasters in Lenin's, Lenin's and Stalin's Russia that resulted in tens of millions dying with the, with the communist ex, uh, experiment that went bad um, Mao Zedong's um, experience with uh, his attempts to, to change China and transform it, which also resulted in, in millions and millions of deaths and, and other similar failed experiments, two world wars and so on, all were seen as a failure of modernism. And so along comes now what we call postmodernist thought, which originated to a great degree with some thinkers in Germany, uh, manifested itself among uh, famous French thinkers like um, Derrida and uh, Foucault, uh, showed up in this country fr from the pens of men like uh, Herbert Marcuse. And in essence now what they argued was since, since reason and logic have also let us down, let's criticize everything. Let's 
in a very real sense, let's create um, a kind of glorious confusion in the minds of people and argue that there's really not anything that really fits or, or makes sense. And it's in this milieu that we find many of the roots of the confusion that we see in this woke society, this woke culture in which we live today. And so I want to spend a little more time now examining uh, postmodernism and, and talking about its belief, and then I want us to spend a little time talking about um, how we can respond to that, some fallacies that are found in postmodernist thinking. I, I, I looked at a number, I mean, multitude of definitions of postmodernism, and uh, one that I found probably the most succinct, maybe not the most complete, but, but succinct, uh, was found in, uh, of all places, Britannica.com. And let me read that definition. In Western philosophy, a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism, a general suspicion of reason, and then acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. Now, you heard the word power in that definition. I can't stress enough how much emphasis needs to be placed on that. Because whether you're talking about postmodernism or whether you're talking about uh, neo-Marxism, you are talking about people who have a fixation with power, who believe that much of what happens in the world, economically, socially, culturally, you name it, is rooted in power and who's in control. Now, what I would like to do is take this definition of postmodernism and, and, and break it down, and in the process of that, uh, hopefully gain a little bit of understanding of how this is being reflected in our culture today. Again, it is defined as a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism. Broad skepticism. We have been infected with that all over our culture. I mean, more and more we find people, in many ways, unfortunately, justifiably skeptical of nearly everything they see and hear. Uh, there's a cynicism that has begun to permeate our society that in many ways I, I think is, is heartbreaking. Um, we hear the term constantly, don't we? Fake news. Who do you believe? Who's telling you the truth? What, what reports are really accurately telling you what, what happened and what are, what are slanted in a given direction? Um, I think a perfect example of the, of the broad skepticism that now permeates our culture has been reflected very much in, in, the, in the COVID pandemic that we've been enduring for the last 15 months. Um, where did COVID originate? Well, did it originate naturally? Where did it come from? Did it, or was it created in a lab? Did it, did it uh, show up in the, in the wet markets of Wuhan? Or was it created in a lab in Wuhan, China and somehow escaped? And I mean, you hear all these conjectures and assertions about it. And the fact of the matter is that we don't have any clear answers. We don't know who to believe. Uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to vaccinations, look at all the um, stories that are out there about vaccines are deadly. No, they're not. Uh, they contain nanoparticle markers. No, they don't. Uh, they're going to change you genetically. No, they won't. Um, they're going to provide protection for this number of months or that number of months. Maybe you'll be, maybe you won't be infectious to others, and maybe you will. You, you've seen all the all the stuff that's gone on, and, and and sorting through that's very confusing. Trying to figure out well, just just what is true, and of course, the ubiquitous mask. I mean, um, there's still a lot of debate, even as we begin to move hopefully into kind of a post-maskless situation, um, how necessarily were the mask? How effective were the mask? Should, should people continue to wear masks or not? And so on. Tremendous amount of, of, of skepticism now that, that, that permeates our culture. And of course, if, if truth, as postmodernists assert, 
is only a construct in, in, in the United States, for instance, and Western Europe of what they would call the white patriarchy. Uh, white males have dominated and for, for hundreds of years. And so all the problems that we have now are the result of these white patriarchs and, and what they've advocated and, and what they've taught. Uh, if, if it's only what you're told to believe, not necessarily what is real, then why not be skeptical, okay? And so you find these assertions, for instance, and this permeates again that, well, history is written by the winners. Who knows what the true history of the United States is? And so now we find people wanting to pull down statues of, of Christopher Columbus and, and, and uh, they, they're attacking basically all of the forefathers and thinkers of this country from, 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 from Thomas Jefferson to George Washington. And we don't know really the true stories of what these men were like. Um, there's a 1619 project that's seeking to assert that uh, the United States was founded on the backs of slaves. And the 1776 report, which is supposed to be a response to that, there's, well, I could go on and on with, with, with assertions about how do you know what's true when it comes to our history. And again, this, this, this fog, this miasma of, of confusion, which uh, lends itself to these postmodernists asserting, well, how do you know what's true? Just because you believe something is true doesn't necessarily make it true. And if you believe something's true and somebody else believes something else is true, how do you know who's right? Okay? Now, a second part of this definition is that there is a general suspicion of reason. A general suspicion of reason. Now, question, who's going to be the arbiter of what is reasonable? Um, if again, the white patriarchy, as it's called, dictates what is reasonable, does that mean that any disagreement with that is unreasonable? And so if, if, if people of color, for instance, uh, disagree with something that they feel has been asserted by the white patriarchy, does that automatically make it invalid? Or should all of the reason be questioned. Postmodernists will argue that logic and reason are tools of oppression utilized to suppress the underclass. They will argue that lived experience and its feelings should be depended upon more than logic and reason. And so I'm not Native American, therefore I can never understand what Native Americans have experienced. Therefore, I have no right to talk about anything to do with Native American culture because I'm not Native American. And so reason and logic need to be supplanted by listening to people who are Native American describe um, their situation and their feelings and their ideas. Now, is there validity to this? Yes, there is, but at the same time, um, does that mean that it's impossible for a white person to understand a black person or a black person to understand a brown person or a brown person to understand uh, a yellow person? That, I would assert no, that that's, that that's not true. And yet that's, that's really what they're, what they're trying to convey. And again, um, the idea being that don't trust reason, don't trust logic fall back on feelings, and we'll expand more upon this because it's a very important assertion and, and a dramatic demarcation from the way that people have thought for, for hundreds of years now. Third part of this definition, an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. So again, it's argued that following reason and logic or enlightenment thinking is, is the tool of white supremacy. It's what keeps white people in this country in positions of power and control. And so, for instance, you will hear asserted by uh, people at Harvard University that two plus two 
doesn't necessarily equal four, unless you've been trained by and agree with white elitists that created the system. If somebody else chooses to say that two plus two equals five, who's to argue that that's wrong? They're just coming from a different point of view, coming from a, a different thought system. And so traditional methods, and you see this happening all over the country now, traditional methods of teaching math and English, it's recommended should be scrapped in light of racial, racially and culturally sensitive curricula. Modern school curricula, they assert, tell only the story and reflect only the thinking of privileged white men. The history of people of color and their culture and their thought systems are ignored and therefore what needs to happen is there needs to be a rejection and rebellion against the teaching of the white patriarchy. And if that includes reason and logic, then that needs to go. Now, let me share with you what I believe are, 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 are some major errors in postmodern assumptions, some fatal flaws, I think, in the arguments that are, that are put forth. Number one, they're gonna argue that one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems that we have in, in understanding and knowing truth in anything is that there are, you face a given situation, there are an infinite number of choices and an infinite number of ways that, that a certain situation can be responded to. And who's to say what's right or what's wrong? And so someone is ill and they want to call in a medical doctor and, and someone else is ill and they want to call in a witch doctor and someone else is ill and they want to call in a shaman and someone else is ill and they, and, and they wish to call upon a nurse practitioner, whatever. Who's right? Well, they would assert that much of this is related to, to culture and, and belief systems and, and so on. And so who's to say that, that one of these choices is superior to another? Well, but is that really right? Is it really true? Um, I believe that that the declaration that there's an infinite number of choices simply rationally and logically, and here we go with that, just not true. For instance, I climb a tree and I'm say 30 feet up in this tree and the wind begins to blow and I decide, man, I need to get down. Now, <coughs> one of the choices I could make would be to jump, just jump out of the tree. But you and I know but that'd probably kill me or really hurt me. And so that's not a viable choice. Automatically, a major choice goes by the wayside because it could result in death and suffering. And so you simply automatically eliminate that as a choice. And you have really narrowed the field down real quick to, well, which branch am I gonna grab hold of? Am I gonna cling to the trunk? You know, how am I gonna pick my way down? But, but the viable choices are not infinite. They're limited by the situation and the circumstance. Secondly, what about, what about biological constraints and, and how they affect um, our, our choices? My wife and I uh, decide that, that uh, we want to have children. Um, there's not going to be a discussion about who bears the child. I'm a male, I can't bear the child, all right? Right off the bat, biologically, certain choices are eliminated. As much as I might wanna spare my wife the pain of childbirth and the, and the discomfort of pregnancy, it can't be, okay? Biologically, it can't happen that way. Once again, choices really begin to be narrowed down just by reality. Uh, thirdly, choices that are viable have to take into consideration both the future and the ability that one has to interact with others. It's really important. And so, okay, um, I run short of funds. My solution, I take a gun and go in and I rob a bank. Now, is that a choice? Yes, but is it a viable choice? Well, um, that has all kinds of ramifications, doesn't it? I mean, when I'm caught, I'm gonna go to prison. That's not good. If and when I get out of prison, I'm gonna have this on my record 
and I'm not going to be able to hold a lot of positions, a lot of jobs, because I've got that felony on my record. And so is that really a viable choice? No, it's not. In other words, what I'm saying is that when you look at a lot of situations and you begin to look at what are viable solutions to that situation or that problem, you are going to automatically find that they are finite, that they're limited in number. They're not, they're not infinite. And so this idea that there's just infinite choices and we move through this miasma of, of confusion and, and we can never really be sure about what's the right choice and what's not really isn't true. With most situations, there's really only a few choices that are viable, and most of those are rooted in logic and reason and reality. You've got to go in that direction. Secondly, I said there's a, there is an absolute obsession with power among the postmodernist and the neo-Marxist. I mean, they, they absolutely are just obsessed with the fact that there is a group at the top in, in, in the United States is perceived as white males who dominate and, and who control things. And, and that's bad, okay? Hierarchies are bad. They need to be eliminated, okay? We shouldn't have these, these hierarchies of power. And yet the fact of the matter is that nature's filled with hierarchies that to a great degree much of life couldn't function without hierarchies they, they just naturally occur um, when I was a kid we raised cattle we generally have a dozen head or so uh, we had a Holstein cow that we called Jezebel and folks she was a head cow there was a hierarchy she was a head cow where she went all the rest of the cattle went they followed her there was no training, there was no any, anything like that. That's just the way it worked. In studies of chimpanzees, what they found is that uh, in a group of chimpanzees, there will be one male chimpanzee who will be the dominant male, and he will basically control everything that goes on there. Now, what has also been found, and this is interesting, is that the vast majority of hierarchies, when you look at them and study them, are not power-oriented. They are competence-oriented. In other words, uh, the, the lady who runs this company is very, very good at what she does, and that's why she's running the company. This, this man is an incredibly talented architect and he runs an architectural firm but he didn't get there because of a power struggle he got there because he's very very good at what he does in the majority of cases hierarchies are the result of either nature or of competence and the idea that any hierarchy that you see any power structure that you see it's automatically tied to conflict and struggle and, and, and seizing power over others. It's simply not true. You see this reflected biblically, and I think this is important. Uh, Paul, in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, will talk about the hierarchy that's in the family. And it's, it's very natural and very normal, and I know it's dismissed and argued against today, but I mean, Paul makes it very clear that, that Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman, and that that's the structure in the family, that the husband is to be the head of the home, okay? Now, a lot of people rebel against that and all that, but the bottom line is, we see that reflected in hundreds of millions of families, and we've seen it reflected for millennia. It works, it's the way it is. It's a natural hierarchy. I believe one that was designed to function in the way that it does. Um, you can see this reflected not just in the family, but I believe in the church. In the church, is there a hierarchy? Well, yes, there is. Uh, in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul will talk about uh, elders and the qualities should be found in men 
that shepherd or that oversee the flock. Uh, underneath them, you have deacons, you find uh, evangelists and ministers serving uh, various members of the body, performing various functions, but there is a, a hierarchy. The fact of the matter is that for nearly any organization to function, whether it's the family or the church or social organization, whatever it might be, there has to be a hierarchy with someone at the head who's dictating how things go. That's the way life functions. That is not necessarily at all a function of power and of grabbing hold of power. It's simply a reflection of a natural order and structure that needs to be followed. And another point, and that is that truth is always going to trump opinion in the real world. Now, now they're going to argue, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in another lesson, that, for instance, there needs to be a different strand between biology. Uh, the, this is a male, and, and he has the, the sexual organs of a male, uh, but he feels like a female, and, and that's his gender. And gender is separated from sex. And so, basically, what you have is, is biology and psychology kind of at odds with each other. But the fact of the matter is that a woman really can't exist in a man's body. It's a man's body. And somebody may claim they feel like a woman, may claim to be a woman, may believe they are a woman, but if they're in a man's body, they're a man. Biology is unchangeable. Biology is fixed. And all the arguments in the world saying that psychology needs to outweigh biology, chooses to ignore the fact that psychology can change, how one perceives oneself can change, and often does. But the biology doesn't change. The biology's fixed. And so there can be no such thing, although I've seen newspaper articles, you know, about a man having a child. Man can't have a child. Biologically, that's not possible. Again, that's something that's fixed. That's something that's objective, that cannot be changed. And, and, and people can argue all they want, you know, well, but, but this person underwent hormonal treatments or whatever, and, and, and technically now this man is, uh, or this woman is a man, but if she gets pregnant, it's because she has a uterus, okay? Because she is a female. And that is unchangeable and inarguable. And that's where truth is always going to win out. Reality is always going to win out over opinion. And on top of this, and I think this is very important, if there, are, if there exist inviolable objective truths, why can't there exist inviolable moral truths? As much as postmodernists would like you to believe, the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the time, we operate in a very orderly, highly structured, very reasonable world. If I go in and buy a candy bar and the price of that candy bar is $1.39 uh, and then tax added onto that makes it $1.48, when I hand the cashier two $1 bills, I expect to get back 52 cents. That's how it works. That's logical, that's reasonable. Life couldn't function if it didn't operate that way. If there are objective truths like that, why can't there be objective moral truths? What they wanna do is, is fuzz that up and say, well, yeah, maybe there are certain objective truths out there, but morally, you can find no objective truth. I would argue strenuously that that's not the case, and, and we don't have time to go into that, but, but I think it's quite easy to prove pragmatically that there are certain moral truths that protect and guard and guide and are incredibly important, okay? And when one violates or ignores those truths, you begin to pay a price. And finally, fourthly, when God's left out of the picture, I would argue what results is that meaning and agreement are never gonna be found because you simply have one individual arguing with another individual, and then it really does become 
unfortunately, a power play. And whoever can dominate in that situation finds themselves in control. But when you throw out reason and logic, uh, the result is going to be chaos and anarchy. Nietzsche, Nietzsche anticipated this with his God is dead declaration. He predicted a nightmare for humankind if there existed no recognition of a higher power than man's own reasoning. And he was dead right. Absolutely right. Nietzsche's not celebrating God is dead. Nietzsche's saying, listen, if you choose to reject God, if you choose to act as if God doesn't exist, as if God is dead, then you have turned your back on the idea of a transcendent set of rules that everybody must follow, okay? And the result then is going to be that powerful men, uber men, are going to dominate and they're going to control. And whatever they dictate is going to be what is right and what is moral. But that is going to be an ongoing, horrible, bloody battle. And unfortunately, he was almost prophetic in his declaration because look what happened when modernism tried socialism and and communism and fascism. Look at the, the mess and the millions of deaths that occurred because of that. When you, when you reject God and you reject transcendent truth and transcendent moral truths and you leave it up to men to formulate how other men are supposed to live and conduct themselves, inevitably and invariably, what you find is a disaster. It simply doesn't work. And I need to go, uh, again, go no further than just look at the disasters of the 20th century where men decided to set, them up, set themselves up and in a sense try to play God. It didn't work. Let me end with this. In Judges 21-25, as kind of a post-mortem there at the end of the book, the writer says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If you're familiar at all with the book of Judges, you know it was a period of disaster, disastrous anarchy, uh, a horrible period, a blight on the history of Israel. And the writer sums it up when he says, here's the problem. There was no one recognized as being an authority. Everybody did their own thing. It was a mess. That's exactly what postmodernism is pushing and recommending today. And look around at our culture, look at our society, and you can see the mess that exists. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about neo-Marxism and how neo-Marxism and postmodernism interact in a way that is reflective in much of what is going on in our culture today. Thank you. God bless.